so let's start first of all good morning everyone in just a few minutes we are going to have the panel on the future of cybersecurity. Let me tell you that we're going to be speaking both English and Spanish. So those of you who need translation, please uh, go and get uh, your uh, devices. And if you are in the Zoom platform, you may choose uh, the uh, interpretation feature. I want to thank all those of you who were with us uh, yesterday, uh, the first day of our event. We have more than 300 remote uh, uh, participants and over 600 uh, here in the room. So we are going to start with a panel on the future of cybersecurity, the opening ceremony, and the first part of uh, the uh, technical LACNIC technical forum before starting with uh, the activities i'd like to thank all the sponsors that support us uh, for this event so we thank nick br total play cisco nick mexico quatrocom edu unum google netflix fastly m6 amazon dhd with one Uranium 1299, IPXO, IP for Global by Hico, IB Architect, OC Global, IP Broker, ICANN, Matrix Telecom, the Internet Society, and INTC. So thank you for being with us and supporting us. Now we're going to start the panel on the future of cybersecurity. Let me start with the panelists that are with us this morning. First, chairing the panel, Kevin Swift, who is a public uh, cybersecurity leader at LACNIC. And the speakers are Pablo Alvarez, Director of uh, Technological Innovation at the Secretariat of Innovation and um, uh, um, education in Yucatan, Sabas Casas del Rio of Accenture, Mexico, Wilbert Perez Segura, head of CSERT UAD, University of Yucatan, John Brown, senior evangelist of security of Camry team, and finally, Claudio Peguero Castillo, uh, cybernetic affairs advisor of the ministry of foreign affairs of dominican republic so now i leave you with kevin swift thank you uh, muchísimas gracias en primer lugar quisiera decir que todos ustedes tanto los que están en mérida y uh, los que están uh, lejos les deseo uh, un buen día en esta soleada mañana les eh, quiero me gustaría desearles a todos ustedes eh, un buen día estoy encantado de estar aquí para discutir este tema pertinente al futuro de la ciberseguridad no solo mirando lo que sucede en américa latina y el caribe sino teniendo en cuenta las tendencias e ideas a nivel global para obtener una comprensión global de este tema primero debemos establecer el contexto de la seguridad y luego esbozar los ejes estratégicos de esa tarea durante nuestra discusión profundizaremos en los riesgos y amenazas cibernéticas actuales, pronosticaremos su evolución en los próximos cinco años y exploraremos los papeles de los múltiples actores en la seguridad del ciberespacio. También destacaremos el valor de la cooperación y examinaremos cómo enfrentar los desafíos del día en función de las circunstancias singulares de nuestros países en América Latina y el Caribe. Al menos hay tres razones por las que hemos organizado este panel hoy. La rápida digitalización de activos valiosos en todas las empresas en los últimos años. El mayor uso de servicios de Internet durante este tiempo y el uso de múltiples dispositivos de consumo y soluciones de trabajo remoto o trabajo desde casa que demostraron estrategias pivotantes para mantener la productividad durante los cierres pandémicos. Hemos sido testigos en los últimos dos años de un aumento exponencial de los ataques cibernéticos. Estamos viendo una sofisticación de los ataques de ransomware donde los uh, malos actores uh, utilizan el ransomware y otros malware como servicios. Un modelo innovador con el que hemos estado familiarizados en otros aspectos del mundo de la informática, como la computación en la nube. 
The cyber criminal value chain has expanded. Here, I'll mention the example of Conti, the Conti Criminal Group, which has marketing departments, human resources, and other business units, and hundreds of remote staff who, in some cases, are not even aware that they are working for a criminal undertaking. As a result, to secure cyberspace, we need enhanced collaborative actions and accelerated cooperation, requiring the involvement of multiple actors from various sectors. Furthermore, robust cybersecurity requires the awareness from the level of end users all the way up to corporate boards to establish cultures of cybersecurity and encourage the right set of behaviors and practices that will keep us safe. And why are these cultures needed? Unfortunately, cybersecurity risks are asymmetric. Even a small vulnerability, such as a suspicious email or a lack of protocols and contingency plans, can put the best defense systems at risk and lead to extraordinary damages and losses. If organizations fail to prepare cybersecurity and contingency strategies, they must prepare to fail in their regular business strategies. We can no longer ignore the possibility of cyber attacks. It's only a matter of when they occur, or even if we are aware that they are of good, it's no longer about if they occur. According to the 2023 report on global risks by the World Economic Forum, cyber crime and cyber insecurity continue to be one of the top 10 risks globally in the short and long term period. More surprising is the global shortage of cybersecurity professionals to mitigate cyber risk, with a current estimate of 3.4 million cybersecurity professionals needed. And we take into account the quality of available uh, cyber training programs and existing practices for retaining highly qualified professionals in the region. We, we realize that the impact of the global shortage is indeed exacerbated in Latin America and Caribbean as it represents a 17% gap rate. While we have made mistakes in the past, uh, there are some things that we have done extraordinarily well. So, for instance, LACNIC has had a CSIRT since 2015 that provides support to its members by disseminating alerts, mediating in cases of attacks, collecting anonymous reports, and producing statistics to analyze the trends that affect our systems. And our CSIRT head, Ms. Graciela Martinez, is actually supporting the management of today's panel discussion. In addition, we create trusted spaces and LACNIC events to bring together information security professionals and public security actors. This collaboration is reflected in the LAC CSIRTS meetings, the FIRST conferences, and the RISE conference and workshop organized by Team Cymru this week. We are not alone in our work to strengthen cybersecurity. Beyond our alliances with the information security community, we continue to enhance our relationships with other stakeholder groups, such as law enforcement, legislators, prosecutors, and judges, among others. So we must ask ourselves, where are we today and what do cyber skills measurement frameworks tell us? I've shared these slides here to just give us a quick idea as to where we are as a region. First slide. So I'm not sure if someone from the technical team could help me advance the slide. Okay, wonderful. So in our first slide, here we have a, thank you. Here we have a map of the countries that have a national cybersecurity strategy or 
are developing a national cybersecurity strategy. Those in green are the ones that have a strategy. Those in red are the ones who are developing a strategy. And it seems all well and good that the majority of our countries in the region do have something in place. But if we were to look a bit at the details, we notice that there are some older strategies there. And I will ask the question, are these older strategies, do they fully comprehend uh, the current levels of cloud computing and the implications for same when it comes to collecting volatile digital evidence? And from a developing world context, would older strategies bear in mind the increasing levels of digitization across public utilities and in particular critical infrastructure, that is to say water, electricity, gas, and would there be sufficient protection of this sort of infrastructure? Our next slide, and I'll again ask my technical team to help me as the remote technology at its best. Okay, thank you. Our next slide shows the sea certs across the Americas. And this is very good to note that a lot of our countries do have sea certs. What we see in the details are that there are various types of sea certs, uh, from the governmental to the academic, national, military, police, and in various sectors. And the idea is that these sea certs will need to grow together and connect each other to be able to strengthen a community's ability to monitor upcoming threats and coordinate technical responses. And my last slide looks at countries with legislation in place. So again, at first glance, very good news that nearly all of our countries, except for four, have some sort of legislation in place. But if we were again to go into the details, what we do not see here, for instance, is the quality of effective legislation that each jurisdiction will have. So for instance, do we have up-to-date definitions of cyber crimes? Do we have uh, the principle of dual criminality uh, in mind, meaning that are these definitions harmonized to a certain level that they can allow for mutual cooperation across jurisdictions? So these are some of the snapshots of what we have in the region. And I'm here to speak to five colleagues, five experts in their sectors and their countries who approach cybersecurity from various perspectives. The idea is that we have a good look at the things that we have done well, discuss the challenges we face, but also highlight the opportunities that should be seized to strengthen cyber resilience, both at the level of organizations and at the level of entire communities. Joining me today, Pablo Alvarez. Pablo is Director of Development and Technological Innovation at CS, the Secretary of Research, Innovation, and Higher Education of the State of Yucatan. He's also promoter of the first cybersecurity engineering program and first specialty in cybersecurity in public universities in Yucatan. In the direction he has established the first technology transfer team and coordinates the largest innovation event in the southeast of Mexico, Yucatan I-6. And he has been an IT consultant with more than 16 years experience with software companies with projects in Slovakia, Chile, Argentina, Ecuador, Peru, Guatemala, Colombia, Mexico, and the U.S. Next to Pablo, we have Sabas Casas. He is Director of Cybersecurity Practice at Accenture Mexico. He has worked in various countries in Latin America and Europe, focusing on the development of his professional career in the communications and IT sector. Prior to joining Accenture, he developed extensive experience as the leader of cybersecurity uh, company developing the, sorry, delivering security operation center services, consulting cyber intelligence, integration, and awareness projects. To my left, your right, we have Wilbert Perez. Wilbert is the head of the UADI uh, CSERT Computer Security Incident Response Team, who also works as a teacher and trainer with the Autonomous University of Yucatan of future information and communications technology administrators in competitions control and assurance of information. 
Next to Wilbert, we have John Brown. John Brown is a senior security evangelist and member of the Team Cymru outreach team. Prior to joining Team Cymru, he was CTO of a regional ISP that provided internet and voice services via fiber optic and microwave technologies. Mr. Brown has actively been involved with internet technologies since 1984. When as a high school student, he connected the local university's Unix systems. He has held senior technical training and customer support engineering roles at various companies in Silicon Valley. He is an active entrepreneur, having founded several successful technology companies. Mr. Brown was the principal networking and technical engineer for ICANN's L Root DNS server, part of the global critical DNS infrastructure. He is passionate about protecting the internet from cyber criminals teaching and passing on knowledge to others so that the internet remains an open and safe system. And in his non-work time, he enjoys downhill skiing, flying airplanes as a private pilot, and traveling and spending time with his family. And last but not least, Ambassador Claudio Peguero. Ambassador Peguero is currently the ambassador for cyber affairs of the Dominican Republic. He's also vice president for GRULAC of the United Nations Special Committee in charging in preparing a new international convention against cybercrime. So for short, we call that the UN Ad Hoc Committee. He is president of Interpol's working group on heads of cybersecurity units of the Americas, among other activities. He is also a general of the Dominican Republic National Police with 35 years of service, working among other responsibilities in various aspects of the fight against cybercrime for the last 20 years, including the drafting of the Dominican Republic's cybercrime law and its ratification of the Budapest Convention. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a well-qualified panel of experts here for you today. And it's with that in mind that we'll go straight to the questions. And my first question, I'm going to switch over back to Spanish, and I'm going to ask my question to Sabas. So our first question, I'm going to continue in Spanish. What would be the greatest cybersecurity threats or the greatest risk in the cyberspace that we will have to face in the coming five years. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Before answering your question, I would like to give you two facts that I think will raise the awareness of this forum. Today, we estimate that the cybercrime business worldwide amounts to six trillion dollars. So this would imply being the third greatest nation in the world after the United States and China. It is expected that this amount exceeds the United States and will become the quote unquote nation that is the most powerful economic power in the world. So all the money that will be obtained, extracted illegally will be it taken away from us. So major companies, medium sized and smaller companies will be affected. So the cyber threats will affect all of us. I would sum this up in three parts. How I see this, there are a whole series of factors that are critical factors when tr dealing with cyber threats. The digital identity, the paradigm of cyber trust, or things that prevent people uh, because the companies have to be at all times monitoring their businesses. This will continue. So cyber trust, then the cloud, the virtual environments have become something that have to be protected with native controls and this will remain a trend. Then the all the vendors, machines, or humans that will be connected to our organizations will be a weak point and will continue to be so. And finally, the change that is taking place in prioritizing data versus protecting the perimeter of the surface of the businesses. So these four threats, everything that encompasses these four factors will remain a trend in the future. Now, technologically, we have to consider three other technologies. One is artificial intelligence, 
cyber players are starting to use AI to develop not only malware and ransomware, but also attack modalities. Quantic computing will break down encryption. Y, y luego las and finally, the hybrid trends and virtual trends like metaverse, like the virtual environments and augmented reality. So this has to be considered among the threats. And finally, the processes. We see a trend related to the complexity of cyber attacks and the lack of talents in the context of the amount of things used for cyber defense, the reduction of cybersecurity vendors, and secondly, a lot of focus is being placed on these models, these services offered by such providers like MS, managed security services. So these vendors are delegated the responsibility of these services that have to be managed remotely and focused on those who know how to do things. So these would be the trends, the main trends from my standpoint. I think those trends, in particular, as you mentioned, the AI, quantum computing, uh, the well, cloud computing, and all have continued. Um, that delegation of the capabilities—that's something that's very um, interesting for us to take note of. Um, I'm continue back in Spanish, and I'm going to ask the same question to Wilbert. 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 What are the greatest cybersecurity threats? or the greater risks in the cyberspace that we have to face in the coming five years from your standpoint. Hello, Kevin. Hello, everyone. I agree with Savas in the sense that cyber attacks will continue in the coming five years at all levels of organizations, whether small, medium, or large organizations among the main threats that we will continue to see. We have the identity theft, mostly affected by an important threat, which are namely social engineering techniques that will be applied to the end users of the IT users. And this not only has to do with the threats, but also of the vulnerabilities that we continue to have and that we don't correct, particularly on counting with someone in the organization who is in charge of cyber security issues or information security, like a CISO. And this individual should have the organizations aligned, supporting this with policies that are addressed of the current threats. Savas already mentioned the incorporation of emerging technologies such as AI. This will help malicious actors to counteract all the cyber security act, uh, cyber threats. So we, there has to be leadership in cyber security issues, and we must not forget the end users. Training, awareness raising for end users are very, very important. We need to have from a very early age among young people the awareness of these issues, digital assets. Young people today are native uh, digital individuals, but they don't have that culture, although we do have a culture for taking care of energy and water resources. Today, we have to have an ingrained cybersecurity culture. We also have to work in collaboration both with the government and the enterprises. Thank you, Wilbert. Yes, prioritize to prioritize young people and end users. This is very, very important. And regarding artificial intelligence, today tools are being used of AI in order to support identity theft with different options. We now go on to the second question. And now I'm going to ask Pablo this question. Pablo, could you please explain which are the roles that the multiple stakeholders have to play to ensure the cyber case? What is the role 
of the government, the private sector, the academia, and so on. Yes, thank you. Well, this will also be a personal standpoint. And the following thing is very important. Even more than the skills or what has to be done, I'd like to refer to three pillars. The first pillar is to take care of the interface. And what do I mean with interface? The interface between the chair and the keyboard. And if you didn't understand that analogy, that's part of the problem. The interface means the human factor is the most important element of cybersecurity. Social engineering is the most vulnerable point in any organization. The people who work for you are the most important element. Secondly, do not minimize any act that might seem a minor act. I would wonder if you have seen a small domino uh, pushing down a higher and a higher domino. And the same happens with the security briefs. The same thing happens with the businesses. And the same thing happens with those small places that you don't pay attention to and you have a very important threat there. Now, let me give you an example that is a very practical example because it's something that happens to all of us. We think that among the with the policy, we'll be fine, figure out a solution to things. We can set the basis, but we as human beings are very clever in order to go in some direction. In the past, you could put just anything in your password, but then further complexity was added, eight characters, then said add a uppercase. And people used the uppercase for the first uh, character of the password. Then include a special character and everyone used uh, a, a dot or an admiration, uh, exclamation mark, and then a numbers. And most people selected a one when you had to include a number. And I see many of you are smiling, so I think many of you will change your password right away. So the human side of things is very important. Don't minimize something that can be enormous. Therefore, what is the position or what do we have to do as governments? We have to become evangelists, what John is. We have to start to give the information to make the tools available to average human beings, to people who are on the street, to be aware that they are responsible for their own security of themselves as individuals, of their businesses, and of their environment. So we really have to focus on that layer. We have to be aware of what is at our reach. And it is in that layer where the most vulnerable factors are. So as governments, we really have to make people aware of this and we have to evangelize people. And this will make cyber criminals face higher barriers. And I repeat this in English. It's about the when. No es como le hago para no. So it's how I will react when I am attacked. 75% of all attacks in Latin America have been in general terms in those countries where they had the policies that Kevin mentioned. And numbers will frighten you, and numbers will change. And today we hear that Mexico has the largest number of tax, and then we hear it's Brazil. But it's not about who has the largest number of tax. It's important that people are aware that these things exist, and that people are aware, are aware that they can do things. Things are in their hands. Small changes, they can deal with small changes. This is about evangelizing again and again. We must spread awareness, um, not minimize those small attacks because they have a long chain behind them. And that's one of the best contributions that government can do by empowering people and establishing this culture of cybersecurity based on awareness. Um, sigo en español. Um, hago la misma pregunta. I'm going to ask the same question to Sabas. The question is, the roles that the multiple stakeholders have to play and what is the role of each stakeholder? What are your thoughts on that? Gracias. Thank you. So, in terms of stakeholders, we have the governments, we have the private companies, 
we have the academia, and we have law enforcement. These are the major ones. I think that governments have to be concerned about what Pablo said, the awareness raising um, in the families, the parents, so that they have minimum information on cybersecurity, and this is something they will transmit to their children. And also in terms of regulations, of course, there has to be a regulation in place. And so that they are concerned about this. They have to have people who know about cybersecurity in their boards. It's very difficult to pass legislation on something that they are not aware of us. And cybersecurity is high, highly technical. If you have. You really have to have people around you who assist you in passing laws or transmitting best practices from other regions. In the case of Spain, they have an organization called INCIDE that has been working for many years now in helping the government to implement policies and practices and to support the ministries in Spain and that can be easily replicated. On the other hand, uh, the companies, I, I think that we have to focus a lot on collaboration in the private sector. It's a key thing. It's essential for competition to be combined with uh, collaboration uh, and intercompany collaboration. Uh, myself, as CEO of a company, I uh, always promote collaboration with other companies because in the end it's the only way you can fight against cybercrime. And then you have the academia, uh, training, training, educating and educating and it needs to be theoretical and hands-on. I think that the Yucatan government is doing things very well. They created cybersecurity engineering, a four-year, uh, a one-year specialty for people um, graduated in other specialties that wanted to uh, uh, focus on cybersecurity with a very good uh, with laboratories and very good uh, combination. I think that this should be replicated elsewhere in the country. And finally, cybersecurity forces need to be very coordinated, not only at a national but at an international level. And the national level must include all uh, law enforcement uh, and in also including the private sector. And I'm looking at you because I know that you are deeply involved and I say international collaboration because cyber attack is uh, limited in to national scope is always very rare it's usually some of the actors are outside the country and unless you have that coordination it's very difficult and Interpol is doing a good job by the way awareness building in families uh, the role of governments to regulate but I think I like what you mentioned there. It must be specific, fit for purpose, because we have to avoid in regulating one thing, infringing on the rights of others. Uh, the role of universities to continue training, and then that coordination aspect that is required by law enforcement, those are very uh, important points for us to take with us. Bueno, I'll continue now in Spanish to our next question. Y esta this third question is how can we improve cooperation formal and informal cooperation now sabas mentioned uh, uh, collaboration and cooperation with the authorities so how can we improve both formal and informal cooperation both at a national and an international level with all the efforts uh, for cyber security and here i'm going to ask claudio Thank you, Kevin. Good morning, everyone. Well, I think that to, if we want to understand that, we need to understand at least three important factors. And I think that in a way we have uh, uh, already heard uh, some speakers, starting with the maps that you showed, where we see the countries in the region that have cyber security uh, uh, law, law against cyber crime, uh, sea search. There is an entire cyber ecosystem. That's the first thing that we have to bear in mind. So although it has some peculiarities, it, uh, there are also many common things. We speak of cyber security but, uh, to prosecute cyber crime. We speak of cyber diplomacy on the other. But, it, but ultimately, there's a connection between all that. And one of the connections has to do with uh, something that uh, was mentioned, uh, I think, by Pablo and Sabas. 
In cyberspace, we are used to the traditional borders. We have very clear cut air spaces, land and uh, sea, maritime spaces, and there are very clear reins of sovereignty and jurisdiction at a justice level. But in cyberspace, that model does not apply. So to that end, we need several things. First of all, international treaties enabling us to have access, as Sava said, an element is usually not limited to a jurisdiction. So either from the point of view of the management of a cybersecurity incident or if it's a cybercrime because it has been classified as such in law, I need international cooperation as the Budapest Convention and as what we are developing now in the United Nations. So I absolutely need those tools. But on the other hand, we talked in here in uh, the protection of critical infrastructure, and some critical infrastructure is in the hands of the private sector. Probably one of the main critical infrastructures is telco, is tel uh, telecommunications and uh, the internet. So those are the most important from the standpoint of availability. What is the importance of private and public cooperation? Last night, I was saying that one of the greatest values of this type of events is the networking that uh, spins off. Uh, as a matter of fact, I have a colleague that at least somebody here must know who it is, says that beer is the best networking tool So, because you need to generate trust. As a, uh, when you request law enforcement uh, or you you, re you ask an ISP for information, the, the company needs to trust the counterpart because of liability issues, because that company as, as, as banks can uh, is liable. So there needs to be a trust. Uh, there must be trust. There must be public-private cooperation for the system to work. So in the end of the day, we're all connected. If and there we have the role of cyber diplomacy, if we have incidents, the first thing that we tend to do in cybersecurity is attribution. But beware, because the country came from an ex country, but that doesn't mean it was sponsored by that state. So attributions may lead to diplomacy problems, and that is why di cyber diplomacy uh, is important too. So it's an ecosystem that needs to work all together. And I'm so happy to be participating in this forum because I think that all of us, in a way, need to understand and to participate in the different aspects of this topic. System, the differences that we have to consider when it comes to cyber issues and very importantly, networking, creating those uh, links of confidence, having those trusted spaces. That's, that's very crucial for what we need to do. I'm going to ask that same question to you, John. So, John, the, what, what do you make of how do we improve formal and informal cooperation? Well, thank you, Kevin, for having me here today and to our audience. Um, to, to improve the f both formal and informal, we really need to build trust groups. We need to get people talking to each other. The thing to keep in mind is, is that our adversaries, the criminals, have already built a network, right? They're communicating. They're building infrastructure. They're building their own cellular phone networks. They're building their own encrypted VoIP networks. They're building their own infrastructure. And they do this without worry or concern because they understand that it helps benefit their economic uh, gains, right? I mean, as, as was said earlier, cybercrime is going to be the equivalent of the third largest country in the world from an economics perspective. This is about money. And so they're perfectly willing to put the investment in, and they can do so without the constraints, <coughs> excuse me, without the constraints of regulation, right? I mean, their regulation is themselves. And so uh, it's about building a trust and building a communications to support formal. But, you know, as, as some of us will, will say, if you know what the TLP protocol is, traffic light protocol that we use to, to set security levels, you know, 
beer is the best trust maker. Well, there's several of us in this room that also have a TLP level called TLP wine, right? So if you've had a glass of wine with somebody, you've had that beer, you've sat down at, at an event, you've built that communication, you've looked them in the eye, you know, okay, we're going to work together to solve that. And that can transcend both local boundaries and international boundaries. So we talk about the physical space of our countries. So that trust can now be built across the border. But I also will say is that that trust can also be built across culture, across gender, across people of different types in different places around the world, because we have a common goal, which is to reduce cyber crime. And so I encourage each and every one of us today in this room and in other events similar to this is to build that trust, work with folks to help that. And I'll give a quick story as to how this is very beneficial. Some years ago, I was at a, a conference and I had a gentleman come up to me from a national level law enforcement and he was complaining about having to figure out some stuff. And so I made some introductions and that was nice. But what really happened later on from that introduction was back in my hometown, our attorney general was investigating um, crimes against children. And he ran into a VPN provider that was out of another country. And immediately they threw their hands up and said, well, we're not gonna get anything. There's an MLAT, there's all of these bureaucratic processes that are gonna prevent us from getting to the information. And I was talking to this local investigator and I said, well, you know, I happen to know a guy. And I talked to my friend in this other country who knew the owner of this VPN provider. He's like, they'll hold the evidence, they'll hold it. They won't release it without the right paperwork, but they'll do evidence preservation now. Really? So we got the two of them together over an international, across the ocean, emails, poof, they held the evidence. It was some five or six months later that all the bureaucratic process happened and they were able to get the evidence. But if they had merely waited to, for the process to take place, they would never have had that evidence, right? All of that happened because of people building trust in a meeting like Latnik or in a CSERT meetings, or shamelessly, our RISE event that we'll have later this week. But those are the places where we need to build trust. Hello, right. <laughs> A wonderful point, Strand. So, um, of course, business organization principles talk about six degrees of separation and formal cooperation represents that. But what we need is just one degree possibly. And that's where the informal links over bears. Um, that really helps us get to achieve what we need to do uh, in the cybersecurity space. All right, um, same question. And we'll put this question to you now, um, Pablo. O sea, ¿cómo podemos mejorar la cooperación? For How can we improve formal and informal cooperation? Well, the basis is what John said. It comes from the side of a trust among humans. And I'd like to say it, cyber trust for the... Uh, we, we need to reach the trust with the people we... Uh, uh, close deals with. For instance, let me give you an example of what we're doing in Yucatan. This is something that at a country level, at a state level, Latin America needs to start working too. Let's not forget that we have a big arm in universities. It's much easier to sign a, a collaboration a agreement uh, between universities than between governments, inter-university agreements. There was a capture the flag competition a month ago between Cardiff uh, University in Wales and here in Yucatan. We didn't have to do much paperwork. We didn't have to do much. What do, did we focus on? And the passion of young people and the passion of the universities. And Wales is one of the countries with uh, among the best uh, cyber security uh, book of knowledge that helps regulate the EU. So through them, we're going to see how with the university, we can start developing that talent. And when I speak of trust, I also, I, I, I'm not neglecting those small things that, albeit not perfect, are excellent. 
when we wanted to launch cybersecurity as a specialty at an occasional level, you need to say, well, who has a PhD? Uh, who are the PhDs that will help us develop the curriculum, the syllabus? And in cybersecurity, are there any, is there any such thing in Mexico? No. So what am I going to do? I don't know, but I'm going to do something, some small change. Do you have any experts? It was, he was a hacker. Would he work? Everything works. And you start little by little developing things. Do not minimize any acts in favor even when small, because that may lead to big things. What started with the dream of uh, uh, having a better um, specialty, finally we ended uh, uh, collaborating at, with international universities that helped uh, um, work at a diplomacy level. And now, less than a year later, we are speaking of these issues in a city that didn't used to speak of these cities. The fastest way to collaboration is through trust, finding ex examples, and the best muscle with passion is among young people. And we need to prepare the people of the future who will be then have in their hands what we will be leaving behind. So how will you go about this? With trust on those small points of international collaboration or national collaboration, but where we find the passion for this topic. What am I going to do about this? Now, what specifically? What am I going to do in my enterprise, in my company? Well, I can do a fishing exercise what for to see where the breach is, how well, figure it out, see, find a tool, see who can help you. There's no minor exercise. And all of a sudden, you will come across someone who can do this. And you get to know people and you have a company like Accenture who can help you, and all of a sudden you're in collaboration with all the countries, and all of a sudden you have a country that will deal with cybersecurity in Yucatan. So awareness raising has to do with small exercises that become big. Don't minimize any small exercises and resort to the universities. They are small exercises of trust, relying on our youth. Uh, to continue this forward. And you raised a very important point when it came to creating the cybersecurity program. Traditional universities were like this huge hierarchical structure of doctorates and all that. We don't have the luxury of that in the cybersecurity world. The evolution of trends, the evolution of crimes happen at such a fast rate, but we still have this impetus. We have to do something about it right now. Thank you. Y bueno, sigo en español. I will go back to Spanish now. Now, speaking about training, I have my last question. How can we train future professionals in cybersecurity in the awareness of the current difficulties in retaining highly qualified personnel and the scarcity and the shortage we have at present? And this question is addressed at Wilbert. Now, regarding this question, from my standpoint, I consider that training should be gradual. We have to take, implement a process of sort of maturity with the young men and women who will be in charge of looking after the organizations and protect them from cyber attacks. The academ academia should incorporate the fundamental concepts, the basics of cybersecurity. And young people should understand the value of information, the value of data. So through those solid, that solid basis that can develop their own professional ethics. We need highly ethical professionals who can assist us in the fight against cyber criminality in the coming years. We also need to count on the support of the government, the support of the private initiatives, so that at universities we can generate training opportunities, we can have laboratories in line with the new technologies who can assess the future cybersecurity professionals, develop their technical skills, and also to have the necessary methodologies 
to deal with cybersecurity incidents. At the level of universities, work has to be done at the level of the top university management to define policies that will assist the universities in the update of the curricula in this regard. Gradual approach that's very much needed, looking at women and girls in IT, looking at uh, the youth again. And I liked that you uh, identified there uh, cross sexual, cross uh, sectorial uh, uh, approach with government and ac academia to uh, continue building out uh, the required trainings. Um, so this question um, goes to Claudio. Bueno, I will say the question in Spanish. ¿Cómo podemos entrenar a futuros profesionales en área de ciberseguridad? How can we train future cybersecurity professionals in the awareness of the global shortage at present and the difficulties in retaining highly qualified personnel? Well, that is one of the major challenges we face in the case of the Dominican Republic. We have tackled this from two standpoints of the ecosystem. Was a national cybersecurity strategy that includes a pillar on education addressed at promoting formal education, namely that the universities include cybersecurity in their curriculum. We have at least three universities that include cybersecurity engineering and to have master's degree on cybersecurity. What the government does is to promote through grants the opportunity for to young people to follow these studies in the field of cyber criminality. One of the major challenges is to make this sustainable because this has to do 100% with the government. One of the challenges we have to fight or uh, compete with, sorry, is with the private sector, with the financial sector, with multinational companies that will offer higher wages compared to what governments pay. So we have based ourselves on two main projects. One is the Global Action Against Cyber Criminality, Glacier Press in Europe, to build capacity in the context of the Budapest Convention. Through this, we have managed to extrapolate or rather to incorporate all the training activities into the curriculum of the universities. So all the judges that come to this university have experience on digital evidence. And the same with the attorney generals. So they already have part of the training included in cybersecurity. We're doing this in the law enforcement school. The first responding training is taking place among the police. So when an arrest takes place, they have an awareness of what cyber crime is and also protecting the chain of custody when they find evidence. So this is the machinery that should never stop because I cannot prevent, I cannot run the risk of losing resources, but I cannot avoid that. So this could be a solution to the problem. We have to constantly train people. And of course, we have to make this attractive so that young people join these options idea as well of that continuous uh, training in the public sector. Those are wonderful ideas. And I'm pretty sure that many of you will want to probably approach any of our panelists after and ask them for further information. Uh, John, uh, same question. <laughs> How can we train our future cybersecurity professionals? Training is, is an investment in humans. It's an investment in people. And, and I think the first place that we need to really start working with cybersecurity from a training perspective is at home, right? And, and the challenge that we have today is, is that as parents, we can teach our children how to be street smart, right? You're walking down the street, something looks sketchy. You can help educate your child to maybe walk on the other side of the street. Or you, you learn as you travel and move around in life that maybe this section of town isn't the right place to be and I should be somewhere else, just by looking at the surroundings. The challenge that we have in the cyberspace 
is, is that our parents today, the parents of children today, are also themselves struggling to learn what does it mean to be cyber safe. And so if they're struggling, how do they help their children learn to be cyber safe, right? So we need programs uh, from a governmental perspective in our schools, in, in our society, and that just helps take care of the beginning. I've heard a lot of talk about we need to be doing training and better at university. I would take a step back and say, we need to be doing things that invigorate, that, that bring the cool factor to a high school child, right? Because if they're going to, they're the ones that are making the decision of what they're going to do in a couple of years. And if they think that cyber crime or cyber security or investigations isn't cool, they're not going to go do it. So yes, we need good programs at university, but we need programs that invigorate and excite our youth into the value of this. And one of the things I like to say to people at times is, to kids is sometimes it's like, social engineering is a fancy term we use. I have a different term. It's called hack the human. How do you hack the human? How do you get him to click on that phishing email? What do I do to make that happen? So, you know, it's like, oh, wait a minute. A teenager says, ooh, I can hack a human. That sounds kind of fun. Let's figure that out. Okay, now I've changed the mindset to get them involved. More importantly is even after university, our enterprises, our governments, our corporate enterprises, our private sectors, we need to make the investment into our human capital, not only current training, but recurrent training and advanced, right? You stay at your job because you are excited by your job. So we got to keep our cybersecurity folks excited by their jobs to stay at their jobs. That requires an investment, and that investment needs to be coming from the top of the organization down. Okay, thank you, John. Thank you, John. I like that. Keeping, making cybersecurity attractive, sexy for teenagers. Um, the other day I was having a conversation as to where teenagers get their info, and it's all of these new age platforms that I sometimes just have an account but I never enter. But I think once we're able to use those can, uh, channels, we'll be able to really get them excited from an early age. All right, so my esteemed panelists, thank you very much for your insightful interventions. Before we go to our Q&A segment, I'd like to invite our Maestro Ceremonies, uh, Sandreas, to explain the dynamic that we expect for you for this second part. Thank you very much. To make this more interactive, I would now invite you to join the uh, slide. We're now going to share on the screen the QR code so you can access this. And for those of you who are following us remotely, we're going to include in the chat the AHA slides so you can access the link. So once you access the AHA slides, we invite you to tell us which were the cybersecurity concepts that you would like to highlight from this panel. It's important that you write one word per field. And while we continue with the panel with Kevin and the panelists, we invite you to write down these words and at the end of the session, Kevin will show you the results with a word cloud, what you identified as very important for this community. So now I give the floor back to Kevin so he can continue with the panel. So as Sandra mentioned, towards the end, we'll look at that word cloud with those highlights of the question of the uh, answers that you, the audience, uh, both in the room and online, are going to give us. And right now, we are going to go straight into questions and answers. Uh, so for our questions and answers, I'd like for anyone who's interested to approach the mics. And we'll also be entertaining questions from our online audience. And for that, uh, we will be looking at my colleagues to facilitate uh, some of those interactions. So I think, yes, Nacho? And of course, with the questions, um, please, um, could you tell us who the question is directed to? So when you're making your questions, uh, please indicate who do you like to direct your question to? Sí, eh, eh. We are running short of time for questions, so I invite those of you 
who wish to ask questions to go up to the microphones. We have time for two questions only. I have a question. Latin America is under attack or Latin America has the capacity to generate attacks to other parts of the world? And who are you addressing your question at? Which of our panelists? The question is whether Latin America is under attack or whether attacks may come from Latin America. Well, both things. The entire world is under attack. Actually, nobody is free from uh, cyber attacks. There are many reasons why countries, companies, people are cyber attacked. Not all reasons are economic. There may be political interests. Uh, there may be many reasons. A company of the competitors may want to um, uh, uh, gain a better um, uh, market share and uh, destroy their, uh, their competitors, and everybody's a target. So Latin America clearly is uh, under threat, under attack, and uh, things uh, are going to worsen. Some statistics relate the number, the, the, the amount of business in a specific region versus the uh, uh, GDP, and Latin America has very low ratios. That means that the, the number of attacks will grow. If those ratios are to stabilize, uh, cyber attack versus GDP, that that ratio, if if uh, that is going to worsen, in uh, we must expect uh, more cyber attacks in Latin America than in uh, the United States and Europe. So yes, we are under threat, and that's a matter of concern. And on the other hand, yes, we also have very malignant talents here. Unfortunately, it's uh, making money with cyber crime is quite easy. There are mobs, and here in Mexico, we know who are ready to hire talent and they pay very well and they may be anywhere. They just need a computer and internet connection. So unfortunately, yes, we are also a uh, uh, culture broth for cyber criminals. Uh, Secretary General Rodney Taylor in the audience. Please Good morning. Go Thank you, Kevon. In, in English, I'm Rodney Taylor, as you pointed out. Um, my question is <clears throat> directed to you, but maybe you can redirect it. And the question is, within our region, what are, um, are there any particular countries <clears throat> excuse me, that are, are doing well in terms of the protection of critical infrastructure that we can use as models, uh, particularly in terms of the legal frameworks, the institutional capacity, the, league, the cooperation, and so on within the region. Are there any countries that you're aware of that we can hold up as good examples? Thank you. Right. And the question you're directing it to, pardon? Um, to you, but <laughs> you, you feel free to redirect right. it. Well, uh, obviously, I have my views and my info, but I'd like to probably invite one of our panelists uh, to talk about their country's development. I think I will call on... Um, um, Claudio. Bueno, ahí lo malo de... Well, the bad thing of answering myself is I shouldn't do self-promotion, but uh, I can offer the expertise of Dominican Republic because for 20 years we've been working for this. We started with uh, the legal framework for cyber crime in 2003 and uh, so I think that in view of our maturity we can share experience and the same applies to the national strategy for cyber security so I offer the experience of Dominican Republic if you're interested in that moving right along we are coming to the close of today's panel and I just have one last question I'm going to ask everyone. Um, given the time, I'm going to ask you to probably reduce your responses to probably about two minutes. And this last question deals with um, 
reflections from where you are in your professional career, your professional development, reflections on uh, what uh, are the um, what is the outlook we have for cybersecurity in the region? What what is our future? What does our future look like? Es una es un océano azul. It's a blue ocean. Cybersecurity is a blue ocean. There is too much to discover in both sides, the red and the blue side, the good and the bad. So this word that hasn't been used in this panel, and I need to mention it, and it is innovation. We have to innovate in teaching techniques and uh, uh, implementation at universities and companies, technical councils and government. Innovating goes uh, is more uh, related to scientific method than creativity. There's a hypothesis, you experiment, you fail, and you start again. Let's do that in cybersecurity. Let's uh, uh, think of hypothesis in our company so that in the future, in this blue ocean, both sides from the ethical and non-ethical side, the scale may move more towards the ethical. Let's experiment in collaboration. Let's make it fun. Let's uh, make hacking the human more to so that the young may see this side as an attractive side for them to operate. How are we going to do it? Through innovation, by experimenting and uh, uh, appealing to the young to do experiment and uh, governments and universities. In Yucatan, we are doing that. And in those experiments, we've had fabulous results. In less than a year, we manage to create the career in cybersecurity, the uh, two laboratories, protocols for rapid response, committed universities, citizens that are understanding, and panels that are helping the community at a Latin American level. Let's keep on with these experiments. I see an uncertain future. My reflections are towards, uh, are more prone to worries. And I think that as a society, we're not aware of what's coming. The revolution of uh, artificial intelligence, uh, every time a new app appears in Instagram or whatever, I always think what what a cyber criminal could do with that type of apps. And I, I get frightened because I see many things in my daily life. We may not be aware of what's coming. We may have, we should, maybe we should worry more. And when, as we worry, well, let, uh, what I would do in each of us here and uh, uh, in the Zoom is to worry about our key assets. If our key asset is identity, let's take care of our identity. If it's the money that we have in the bank, let's choose safe banks. If our main asset is our child, let's um, raise awareness, let's teach our children to know at least the minimum things of cybersecurity so as to protect them. If we are the CEO of a company and we have to see to the protection of the company, let's protect that company to make it resilient. But that's my opinion about the future. Last reflections. Bueno. As to this question and a final reflection, cybersecurity is a work that requires collaboration by all the stakeholders. We also need to work on raising awareness within the organizations, not to neglect the education, the training of the staff, because ultimately they are the ones that operate ITs and they need uh, to be aware of a state of the art uh, cyber threats. That would be my final comment. John. Um, I want to just emphasize that we need to, it's not just about the organization, it's about society, right? We need to be, we're in a societal change. 
right? As was just recently spoken, we have a, a, uh, artificial intelligence, right? We have all these new technologies that are coming. And, and like the, the, the previous uh, gentleman, the worry of apps and what data is being sucked out of those apps and how is that data being shared and who is it being shared with? These are things that we need to educate our society on and understand why it is important for them to be protective of their information. We need to be innovative in our way of combating this. Our foes, our criminals, are very innovative. They are not stupid. They are very smart, right? And so we need to jump ahead. We need to not be reactive. We need to be proactive. We need to jump out there and we need to be working collaboratively in a community like this, in a community like FIRST, the Forum of Incident Responders and Security Teams, right? We need to be doing that collaboration and we need to be innovative about it, but we need to be doing that at a society level, not just a corporate or business level, because all of this impacts everybody. And, and, and the criminals are trying to steal grandma's money as much as it is as our business's money. So let's work together, let's cooperate, let's transcend those boundaries and those, those borders and build those trusts. Claudio. La respuesta. The answer, or my answer to the future, on the future, is it, it depends. It depends. It all, it, it depends on what we do today. It depends on each and all of us. Yes, indeed, there are big threats and challenges ahead, but it's up to us to decide what to do today to mitigate those risks and to approach those threats. What are we going to do? We have a risk with artificial intelligence. Well, what are we going to do with that? So it's up to each and all of us. What are we going to do to, for that future, not to be so uncertain or unsafe as Saba sees it, but so that we can see it as a big opportunity of a blue ocean that Pablo mentioned. We had innovate and the experience of Yucatan that went in a very short space of time from just finding out about this to creating the programs, the building out the CSA, to having a conference where we are talking about cybersecurity. We have the uncertainty because there are scary things. And sometimes it's what you don't know that might actually be one of your biggest vulnerabilities. There are scary things out there for the experts. Therefore, we must be in the know. That's the real message here, uh, Kari from Savas. Cooperation, cooperation is key. Cooperation across sectors, cooperation across actors, that is fundamental. Cybersecurity isn't just an IT problem, the IT guy in an organization. It's the grammars, it's the kids. It is across all of society and they must be engaged. And as Claudia said, depending, what are we going to do with this information? How are we going to inculcate this in our everyday practices? We know this is, just, this is no longer a niche topic. This is a topic that affects all of us and we have to work collaboratively in this space to have robust cybersecurity in the region and to buttress our digital development. And with that, we are drawing. Disculpa. Yes. Tenemos unos minutos más. Sorry, my apologies. We have a few more minutes, and I saw that some people had to sit down. Maybe they'd like to ask the questions. Those of you who sat, we managed to get a few more minutes. Perfect. Yes, or even somebody else, if you wanted to come here to the mic. Yes, there, there was somebody who wanted to come here. I'm Jorge Varela of Truxo. I have a question for Pablo. Based on what uh, our colleague said, I don't remember his name, you talked about a culture broth. 
sometimes we train people on cybersecurity and we have noticed that there may be a culture broth when students are taught ethical hacking. There are certain disciplines in the DOS, uh, phishing, uh, testing, pen testing, and development. We know that the university things is something very good that can help, but may, there may also be a uh, broth culture that may have a negative impact. Do you have any solutions, any ideas of how you can curb that cybernetic risks? Yes, that was one of the questions that we wondered when we developed the syllabus. The negative side is always going to be more fun. When you attack, it's more fun. And that's the need that we have as educators to teach the about the repercussions. One of the things that is being more attacked is, I'll give you the candy, but first uh, look at your responsibilities. What are we doing as universities? We, we work just as with martial arts. When you get your black belt, you turn into a white weapon and you have to sign that you understand what that means. And we have to teach uh, our, the young uh, that too. So we have to teach them the tools, but I also tell them, I also tell you if you that you'll run into trouble if if you because uh, uh, you may be a white weapon and you must be aware of the negative impact. Knowing the constraints will help us be more powerful. And believe me, that's what he, the youth is looking because we are putting them. We are showing them exactly everything. You asked for the risk. There's always going to be a risk. But I also remember a phrase that somebody told me when I was working for a company, and he said, Pablo, if we train our people and they leave, we are losing a lot. And the answer there was, and what if you don't train them and they stay? I'd rather run the risk of training them and having them leave because most of them will be in the side that understands everything. Great. I would like to say that maybe the cyber police should be ready to fight against this new army which is about to come. Thank you. Hello. A quick refl uh, addition to that. There we go. Sorry. Okay. Um, just a quick thing with regards to law enforcement and folks working with the children and, and teenagers that hack or do things because it's more fun to attack, right? Um, so the, the Her Majesty, or actually His Majesty now, His Majesty National Crime Agency in the UK <coughs> has adopted a policy of going out and doing what they call knock and talks, right? So you have a teenager who's being malicious. Well, what they will do is they'll go to the family, they'll knock on the door and they'll say, let's have a chat this activity that you're doing i know it looks good on the online game but this activity you're doing is actually damaging and malicious so this is a cultural change within law enforcement right to let's de-escalate let's not criminalize something that's really more about an education and if from what i've heard they've had really good success so i just wanted to quickly throw that i know we're time but i just want to put that out so that's a, a wonderful point a wonderful addition to that um so Lucimara? Voilà, es solo un comentario. This is just a comment. LACNIC has been a forum for the exchange of information on cybersecurity. Throughout the year, we have groups like the first and MOG and many other events. So coming to LACNIC is a place where we can exchange a lot of the experience we have in cybersecurity and to generate the trust we speak so much about. So LACNIC has become a forum for the exchange of trust in our region. And we have the LAC C certs. So the groups in the region are here to exchange experiences. And I'd like to make a comment in the sense that here we have a forum to create trusted relations. Thank you. And with that, folks, this is, oh, there's, do we have time for one more? Okay, one more question. Thank you. 
Ok, buenos, buenos días. Good morning, a Luis Mota from the technological entity of Merida. I'm also teach and cybersecurity courses. And as was mentioned a while ago, there was a concern in the sense that students should learn techniques and skills. But going over to IoT, the devices we have at home, what we now have, there is only limited information and only a limited development of the security for these devices. And I find this quite surprising. There are some cases, you have 70 to 80 percent of these that are automated, and this poses a risk. A while ago, we spoke about raising the awareness of people and finding the weakest link, but people are purchasing these devices, they are installing these devices, and I see there's no security security there. Is there something that is being developed by the companies in terms of education? And this could raise a greater awareness on the security. Is there something that we could do to raise better awareness on such devices? Well, there is uh, cybersecurity is a universe. It's a whole world. It's a very broad field of practice. And one of the disciplines is industrial cyber security, or it's also called OT security. This is focused on electronic devices available in the facilities of the companies, you know, in critical infrastructure where the risk of these facilities and then that these electronic devices are connected to the internet increases the risk for cyber attacks. And OT security is also in charge of the security of IoT devices. And this has to do with the risk that the user of that device has and how this is configured, how it's set up. Very often, the devices that are going to the market have very good security options. But the thing is that you have to set these up, you have to configure this. And this takes us back to what we were saying. If we don't know how to change the Wi-Fi password at home, how will we be able to configure a device that we are setting up for whatever purpose at home? I don't want to give any examples. But this does exist, and the vendors, the manufacturers are concerned about this and there are practices that address how to configure these. But the problem is that this is not used, are only mildly implemented, or only to a limited extent. No more questions. Thank you very much uh, to the audience for your questions, for that engagement that you've had with our esteemed panelists. I'd like to thank our, all our panelists here. Uh, for their various perspectives, for the views that they have shared with us. And I think there are some messages that have resonated with us throughout uh, this morning's proceedings. And I think those are reflected very much here uh, with our word cloud. And I see, for instance, we have the word there in the middle, trust, confianza. Um, we had a commentator speaking about LACNI creating these trusted spaces so that information security professionals and law enforcement and other public safety actors could come together and establish that trust. So in addition to there being formal arrangements, the informal arrangement, the familiarity that we need between each other really facilitates the work that we need to do. I'm seeing we have training, cooperation, youth, and I know several of our panelists uh, spoke a lot about the involvement of youth in every stage of our cybersecurity preparedness. Uh, I see pro uh, privacy, uh, emerging technologies, cooperation, mitigation, awareness, uh, consciousness, uh, etc. So, uh, without further ado, I would like to again thank all of our panelists for being here. Thank you, the audience. I'd like to uh, start a round of applause for this. Uh, what I thought was a very engaging uh, panel and <laughs> you see the faces here feel free to approach any of them throughout this week I know most of them are here for the entire week and continue asking them uh, your questions about uh, the concerns or interests you may have in cybersecurity 
So with that in mind, I'd like to bring this uh, panel discussion to a close and ask um, our uh, MC to lead us into the next uh, part.